This is synchronicity. This is synchronicity. This is synchronicity. This is synchronicity. Welcome, 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 welcome. There was no audio effects on that. I did that with my voice. Welcome to today's show. Uh, my guest today is the awesome leader, fearless leader of Feral Audio, Dustin Marshall. Dustin is a really cool guy. That's the common denominator, I think, in a lot of my guests. They're all cool. I'll try to get some uncool people on uh, so, you know, we can even it out a little bit. But Dustin Marshall, alas, is a cool guy. Um, and he runs Feral Audio, which is a podcast network, um, which is just go there, feralaudio.com. Check out all of the podcasts that are there, um, comedy, entertainment, really cool stuff, like really awesome. Uh, yeah, if you need some recommendations, hit me up and I'll tell you what to go uh, look at over there um, that I like. Uh, Dustin also works for Starburns Industries. He's working on a new show for HBO, doing a, he's the audio engineer called Animals. That's coming up. And so he's, he's an awesome guy. Uh, that's his professional life. Outside of that, um, one of the more interesting people I know, um, and when I say I know, I've met him once, talked a couple of times, but I follow him on Twitter. And I think Twitter is an excellent way to learn about someone's Twitter self, uh, which is not necessarily who they are as a person, I found, uh, but gives you some insight into their inner workings, so to speak, if they choose to use the platform as such. Big Twitter fan. Um, but I know that Dustin is a really thoughtful, intelligent guy, um, and we go into a lot of topics here. Um, some of which is about podcasting, some of it is about uh, mental illness and mental health. Um, he gets pretty deep and pretty heavy with a lot of this stuff, but you know, honestly, these are some of my favorite conversations to have in life, let alone on a podcast. So, um, you know, take a listen going forward. Uh, it's, it's one of the longer ones I've done. Uh, it's about an hour something or other, hour and a half. Uh, but I think you're really going to like it and get a lot out of it. Uh, I definitely recommend sticking through. So, uh, okay, without further ado, here is Dustin Marshall. Thanks a lot. Yo. Yo, what's going on? Uh, I'm going to opt out of the video. Okay. Because I, uh, hold on, maybe I should put some clothes on. <laughs> hey, very familiar with that. <laughs> Saturday, dude. I was dancing to at a '90s club. It was. I ha- I heard Van Halen. I saw on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, that was fucking hilarious. Uh, <laughs> hold on a sec. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, my friend was just like, "Do you want to see Van Halen?" Because I know a guy who can just get us in. I was like, "Hell yeah!" Yeah, yeah, sure. He's amazing at guitar, too. I mean, it's, like, not a normal level of guitar playing. I think a lot of people don't understand that. He's, like... No, he's, he's there. He's like, the last guitar virtuoso. Like, yeah. there's there's not going to be another of that, dude. And, like, there was, like, 15 minutes of the show, maybe even more, where he was just, like, riffing and improvising, and it was just some... It was beautiful. It was... It was, like... He doesn't have a delay pedal, but he uses his fingers to make it sound like it has a delay pedal. It was insane. That is awesome. Yeah, no, I know. I had, I went at school, someone who I grew up around here, we were roommates, and he was really into, like, uh, progressive metal. So, like, Inve Momstein, like, all these really dream theater, and, but they always, all the metal people had, like, a ton of respect for Van Halen, and I never forgot that. It was just like, yeah. Yeah, Even those shredders and stuff are like, wow. I mean, David Lee Roth is like, fucking strangest human being dude he in the middle of a song they were just jamming and he went on the most transphobic racist yeah. tirade <laughs> and he was just like ah, i was in oklahoma boys look like girls it's weird right and it's like hey, a japanese girl i thought she was a boy but uh she's still good at math we're like what the fuck is he talking about <laughs> that's that's great that's awesome holy shit all right. Um, so, okay, yeah. I don't really have any specific format or anything for this yet, but I am, like I said in the email, basically just starting out with people who I think are doing really cool stuff um, and who I also think 
kind of have a unique perspective on life in general, not just life, other things too. So I thought, you know, I follow you on Twitter. I know we've hung out once in the city and, uh, you know, we have a lot of mutual friends, but, uh, you know, you, you definitely fit the bill for that type of person. So I'm, thank you for taking the time to do this on a Saturday also. That's really cool. Yeah, thanks, man. I, you guys are the best. Yeah. I, like, I, we hung out once, but I feel like I've known you guys forever. Yeah, it's cool. I, I feel kind of the same way. It's, it's cool. So I wanted to start with you, with Farrell, uh, uh, you know, naturally. Um, and for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is... Um, you know, in some ways, by proxy, you're kind of the impetus uh, by proxy, like I said, for MindPod Network and a lot of the ways that you've run and kind of set up Feral um, feed into what we're trying to do with MindPod Network, albeit kind of different content on some level. In some ways, it's not, um, but kind of the ethos behind it. So in your own words, what describe what Feral is and kind of the like the ethos behind it. Well, I also got to say, Farrell, or my, Duncan was like, this guy, Ragu, he's awesome. He, 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 him and Ram Dass want to do a podcast. You got to come and like, well, let's just help him start a network. So <laughs> much like he did that, he was the guy who was like, help. He basically shadow produced Farrell and like helped me do that too. So yeah, I mean, wow. the, the, and also Duncan on the Lavender Hour, Chris Hardwick was a guest and he was like, what's a podcast? So like wow. Duncan is quietly behind everything <laughs> in podcasting. Wow. But um, so, yeah, that being redundant, I guess the short, because I, I, I tell a story all the time, but I, I got involved in podcasting when I was in uh, college in Madison, Wisconsin. And like, I was always a huge um, comedy fan. And as a kid, I grew up in Mr. Show, but then I was about 19 or 20, the Mr. Show DVDs started coming out, and yeah. I just got really, really into it, and this is, like, pre-YouTube and stuff, and um, I would just, I heard about Comedy Death Ray, like, the live show in UCB Franklin in LA, and then um, I was just, like, always into comedy the same way I was into bands and shit, so then, like, um, got... Wait, no, no. First thing was um, I was a Loveline fan, and then I didn't <laughs> I didn't ever hear Adam Carolla's radio show, but I followed Dino Stamatopoulos on MySpace, Dino from, like, Mr. Show and Late Night and all that stuff, and then he was like, hey, I'm on Adam Carolla's podcast, and I was like, the fuck is a podcast? Yeah, yeah. And then I opened it, and it, or I listened to it, and it was just, like, mind-bending, like, the most... Because you have Dino, who's, like, the most transparent, honest person ever, and Carolla, too, and it was just, like, the most raw conversation between two adults it, they were just mm. saying shit that i had never heard in my life and my brain like my I, my brain just opened like a sponge i got mm. so excited and i downloaded every single one and then i found out scott ackerman had one and stuff so then um, i was like the biggest fan of that you asked me how i got started right yeah no no i okay. did it it it, it fo- it's complete you're completely on target keep going okay 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 um this is like 2010 and so okay. i was like truly known as like the biggest fan of comedy death ray radio which is ackerman's awesome indie 101 show that he started doing as a podcast and like um he was like way ahead of the podcast curve and he was just bringing all the fucking comics that were in la that like i would never be able to see and doing fuck and it was just awesome and so i got like addicted and then um so i went to the just for last festival in chicago um, and met Scott and James Adomian and this guy who was meeting with Scott and was pitching him on doing a podcast network. Um, and then we all just became friends. And then for the next year or so, I was like interning and like doing some audio stuff for them from afar and just like being like a consultant mm. and helping them build the website. Like before it even had a name, I was just doing data entry and stuff. Right, right. So I was like, really, it was like my favorite thing in the world. I was really stoked <laughs> in what they were doing. And then when it came out, it was just awesome. Um, it was because uh, they did Earwolf. And then um, a year later, I got a phone call from the guy who founded Earwolf. And he was like, my audio engineer just walked out. Um, I've always wanted you to be my audio engineer. Can you come to L.A.? But I need to know by tomorrow. It was a Saturday. And he's like, I'm going to start looking for somebody on Monday. And I just graduated school two weeks before I was breaking up with my girlfriend of five years. I was about, I was about to on Monday sign a lease for a new apartment. Um, and then, uh, so I called both my parents and then they were just, I, they never agreed on anything. And they were just like, yeah, you have to do that. You're going to, your whole life, you're going to regret not doing that. So then, uh, put my stuff in storage 
came to LA with like two carry on bags. It was my first time ever on a plane. And then <laughs> Holy shit. just got off the plane and this guy from Earwolf picked me up and he, he was like, show, handed me an iPhone and it was Scott <laughs> Ackerman and Zach Galifianakis, like welcome me to LA. <laughs> That's cool. And, um, it was just this really surreal thing. And then I was there for about 10 months, but on day one, I pretty much was like, Oh, this, this isn't what I thought it was. And that they were, and then I slowly figured out cause I was becoming friends with all these people and meeting comedians and friends and mm. they were trying to control me. Like you can't be friends with these people. Mm. Blah, blah, blah. And I found out very quickly that they were like kind of screwing them over. It was kind of giving them like a raw deal that they uh. were, they were making him do ads and donations and they weren't paying them and all this stuff. So I just thought it was really like, they didn't give a shit because they're like, Oh, I don't, I, I don't do a podcast for money. I just do it cause it's fun or whatever. But I'm like, well still, right. I think there's a way to do it where the, your, your go-to response to that shouldn't be like, ah, okay. like you shouldn't <laughs> yeah, be used yeah. to it. So then that fizzled out really quick. Um, and at about a, a month as it was falling apart, cause me and Duncan like had been, you know, I was a huge fan of his podcast. I ran into Natasha my first week there. I was like, do you need help? She's like, yes, please. And so I met Duncan my second Sunday in L.A. on his cool. doorstep. And then he took me in. And then it was him, Natasha, and the guest was Chelsea Peretti, who I work with now. And then, cool. you know, and then so Duncan just like he was he was like my guru back home. He got me into Alan <laughs> Watts. Lavender Hour was my favorite podcast. Like he kind of just changed my whole trajectory in my life, like all of his appearances on Rogan and shit like mm. I don't know. Now I'm like, now I'm like working with and like friends with like one of my idols and stuff. Um, and then we just became friends and then it was all falling apart. And the entire time Duncan was like mentoring me and mm. talking me through like rough stuff. And, um, so he was just like, uh, this is what you do, man. He goes, he goes, well, uh, so what we'll do you like, you just, you'll be like, it'll be like a seminar. Like you just, I'll connect you to comedians and then you'll be like, Hey, I'll, here's what equipment you need. Here's what I cost per podcast. Um, once I get the, once you get the ball rolling, you won't need me to record, but if anything ever goes wrong, I'll come and fix it. And like, and I was, and then I was like, yeah, that's a good idea. But I also like, what if we did it like an art collective? Cause I used to volunteer at an art collective in Madison, Wisconsin. And I used to volunteer at a radio community radio station and I was just sort of like, what if we do it like an art collective where we just ask people to like volunteer and then, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and then he, he, his webmaster, Steve, he's like, yeah, I hooked him up with Steve who agreed to do it for free yeah. for like 5% of all feral profits. Hooked us up. We got hooked up with a guy who was like hosted it for free. All these artists did it for free. And then in a month we, you know. I, everybody I asked said yes, and it was crazy. What year was this? 2012. Interesting. Okay. This is, this is we launched May 14, 2012. I cr I created it on. I started working on it on April 16th, and so in less than a <laughs> month, we built a whole website and five shows and all this shit. It was real. It happened really, really fast. Yeah, yeah. That's, um. So yeah. the so yeah, the ethos is. I didn't know like. Right now, we're tr you know the, I've been repaying for this out of pocket, and mm. we've exploded, <laughs> and yeah. so the costs have gone high. So I've bas I've bankrupted myself doing this, um, <laughs> truly. Right, yeah, right. I, I don't doubt that. I... Um, so we're transitioning right now into like we're partnering with it's uh, we're partnering with uh, I work at Starburns Industries, right. like Dan Harmon and Dino's company does like Rick and Morty and stuff, a bunch of awesome shit. They've been letting me use their like state of the art studio to do podcasts for like a year and a half. Um, cause I started working with Harmon and Harmon really loves podcasting and mm. gets it and wants to proliferate it and, and, and is awesome. And like, um, so we're partnering with them and we're transitioning from an art collective into a profit share, like a actual functioning business that, right. cause the one thing I have failed to do, like, you know, cause I, I, I do absolutely everything on my own. So like I curate it, um, I produce the shows, I edit, blah, blah, blah. All the artists do their own content. Well, all the, like not all the not creative stuff I do. Right. Um, but I can't, I, I literally hit the wall where I can't <laughs> do that anymore. Truly. So yeah. I'm like trying to figure it out. But the whole, the whole ethos of this whole thing is that, um, 
putting taking a putting an emphasis on the artist contribution and not treating artists like their employees are working mm-hmm. for you treating it like you're working with them and the emphasis is on the person who took 20 plus years to get really really funny and good at their craft mm-hmm. versus um the the technical person the person providing the service uh, so that was the original like, ethos of it is artist friendly we've uh, we've since rebranded um as fiercely independent podcast because our whole our whole vision is like because now the biggest two networks including earwolf have sold for millions and millions of dollars to right. major corporations who right. now own it which is one way of doing it and like they're they were that was their goal from the beginning um but i really think that this is like a medium and an art form like especially now like i knew the bubble was gonna pop but um uh it needs to be protected and we need it it's just gonna it's the coolest thing that's ever happened in my lifetime and like (laughs) everything else it's just gonna become so lame and uh and uh uh, corporate and Mm. it's gonna you know so it's like i just feel like right now we just gotta like hold hands and stand a line and be like no, <laughs> like, yeah. this is, we're, we own this. We're never selling out. We don't have any intention of selling out. The whole idea is that we own everything. And why would you, if you hand me a $100 million check, like, sure, I can walk away with it clicking my heels. But, like, why not spend 20, 30 years making $100 million? Not that that's the goal of it. Sure, no, like, I totally get it. Yeah, why not do that but own everything and not have to adhere to whatever? So well, that's the e- yeah. ethos behind it. Yeah. Long, and I'm, long answer. Good, No, perfect, amazing answer, actually, because the parallels uh, between podcasting right now um, and the music industry um, are clear in the sense that there are a lot of people who are going kind of the corporate route. That's the way that this advertising model is going to work. It's going to be a straight top down, you know, one of the verticals that a marketing person can understand clearly. Then the alternative is, is what you're doing, um, what we're trying to do with MindPod Network is, uh, is exactly work with the artists, the teachers, the people uh, to create things that ultimately, and this is, this is just kind of my ethos in my career outside of podcasting, any of this stuff is provide value for the end user, right? The person who's going to be sitting there listening to one of your podcasts and having that moment where they're like, holy shit, the same thing that you had, like this is amazing and they can resonate with them immediately. That's super important, which is one of the main reasons I actually wanted to have you on here is I see you fighting for that in a way that is quite honestly, extremely refreshing. Like I went to a music school, Berkeley School of Music, and to see how many talented people basically got chewed up by the system that exists and Berkeley is kind of like a, a, a mini music industry. So for people who don't know and aren't plugged into any kind of like creative industry, it's, it's kind of a nightmare situation. You have middlemen basically leeching off of really talented and typically compassionate and kind of awesome people just taking a cut that's just like destroying not only the creativity in the process, but just kind of like diluting and making stuff kind of shitty. So uh, that's that's truly like what the way you just broke that down is 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 perfect. Um, and I also, on the same token, can relate to kind of the position that you're in running this thing, right? I mean, it is when you keep saying like I bankrupted myself and I kind of hit the wall. Um, I know what that's like. I personally haven't bankrupted myself, but in terms of time and energy putting into running something like you're running. It's it becomes your life, right? I mean, you're you're fighting for something where the system is not set up to accommodate that, um, and when you're doing that, you can run into other stuff. Um, so yeah, I I totally think that was awesome. Yeah, thanks, dude. I well, you know, there's a, a couple to hit a couple of notes on what you just said is like. Yeah, the, another ethos of our thing is cut up a middleman. Like that's the whole thing about the music industry and why yeah. it's a di- it's a dinosaur and it's going extinct. Right. Much like you know that's like TV is fucking dying, and then it had a renaissance where all these big shows happened because like um they were like accidentally slipping through the cracks, letting good fucking shows come on TV because <laughs> the people weren't doing their job, which is make shitty. TV. Yeah. yeah exactly. But um, so yeah, this whole like why you know that's the thing is like. We've always wanted to advertise. We just don't want to do shitty advertisements. Right. We don't want to do, 
you know, the same thing that everybody's doing because if you, a, a lot, the whole idea is like everybody's listening to these podcasts. It doesn't matter if they're networks. Like that's, that's ridiculous because I guarantee a huge portion of Pete Holmes or Mark Marin fans listen to our podcast, like right, Harmontown. Of course. So when you do an ad on Pete Holmes for Audible and then Audible's done ads on podcasts for six plus years and then they come over to ours and they're like, well, you're, you're not making any impressions. It's like, yeah, because <laughs> everybody and their mom has made a Audible account already because you're on every podcast. So like <laughs> what our whole thing is like our new model of advertising is sort of this lost um, model that Duncan Trussell is like masterful at it which is like the live read it's like an old school television and radio thing you know you'd have like dean martin and on a talk show smoking and drinking with a bunch of like fucking being you know, a bunch of guys being racist the same day as junior <laughs> yeah, and then so- he would stand up and he'd be like all right all right all right and he'd walk over and there'd be some like blonde fucking objectified woman next to a <laughs> giant thing of toothpaste and be like ah oh, so what's colgate toothpaste and he'd be sitting there smoking making <laughs> jokes and like she'd be doing a thing and he'd be saying, you know, it's, so it's like it was integrated. And the whole idea is like this is like when a show is like this is brought to you by something, that should be it. The idea of like interrupting the content and hammering in mm. these schizophrenic ADHD, trying to get your attention, bizarre right. snippets of like that make no sense. Like all of a sudden it's like. There, you're like watching like a family and then there's a balloon and the kid grabs the balloon and then it takes off and then it rains skittles or something it's like, what the <laughs> fuck am i watching um so yeah it, the, the that's like when that's it's all like people are everything that comes along people just see an opportunity right. business people and they want to make money and there's nothing wrong with that this is like I'm, I, this is a zero judgment thing like it's not good or bad. It's fine. Like if you if you 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 should you know if you're there's a lot of people who are good at their jobs because there's a lot of creatives that can't fucking keep their head straight. I mean mm. I'm more of a creative than a business guy. I'm fucking crazy. Yeah, really. But like <laughs> when so you need you need an agent. You sort of need when you're a creative somebody to be like no 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 you got to be here right now and I'll take a cut like that works like that's a relationship that's a symbiotic relationship when you have all these fucking people that join the company that are just in between you like like leeching off of stuff and the artists are getting paid the bare minimum and the right. fucking middlemen and people are getting paid before the artists like in the music industry where right. like right. they business costs are insane and always overhead and so then they set aside an amount of money that they pay the artists like the artists aren't actually getting paid for album sales it's just right. this really fucked up algorithm and system that no longer like serves anything of course and also you know so it's it's like me personally, yeah, this is my entire life since I started this thing. It's at minimum, with the exception of a few weeks, like 80 to 100 plus hours a week. It's the first thing I do when I wake up. It's the last thing I do. I usually record all day. I take like four, five, six hours out of my night sometimes to go drinking or hang out with people, mostly podcasters and meeting people and making podcasts. But like, I like personally, I'm just like complete white trash. Like I came from, I'm coming from like complete white trash, like poverty, like not, I don't. So everybody's like standard of living, like, like the old guy I used to work for, he goes, I can't, I don't know if I can do this. Like uh, I'm making no money. And then I, I went and saw how he lived and I was like, <laughs> um, he goes, well, me and my wife have, we we're, we're accustomed to a certain lifestyle. I'm like, uh, okay, why don't you not, why don't you just get a normal apartment and like live modestly? So my, my, what I'm saying is that like, I don't have any, I don't necessarily feel like I deserve anything. Hmm. Um, I don't feel entitled to anything, which I mean, I'm not 100%. I'm, I'm certainly like constantly kicking and screaming, like, why hasn't this happened yet? Like, I sh- sure. sh- this should have happened a year ago. Or like, why has nobody fucking loved me? <laughs> <laughs> Natural human problems. Yeah. yeah. But like that, but you know, it's just, it is worthy of a life. Cause like without getting, you know, from a dark place, like when I came out here, I was in a very dark suicidal place. When I started feral, I thought my life was over and I was like, well, this doesn't work. I can just fucking kill myself. Like sure, that's sure. the, that was where I was at, you know? Yeah. And so through this sort of dark, you, what you're doing is you're accidentally letting go 
And then within mm. the letting go, and maybe, you know, everybody was like, thought I was really confident when it was really, I was very detached. And yeah. I was just like, and I was like, I, I, I was being willed to do this thing because I like to do it because I came out here and I really liked I really like podcasts and I was like, okay, I'm really good with working comedians. I just want to keep doing this. Right. Like I didn't, they, you know, they wanted me to, when they, when they, when the, um, earwolf thing fizzled out, they wanted me to just like, they did it in a way where they were, were systematically not paying me. So I would be absolutely like broke when they let me go, right. which I was because they just wanted me to get the fuck out of LA with my tail between my legs. And, right. But then, you know, they did not think in a month, like, you know, I just wanted to keep doing it. Right. And in, in a way, it was an allergic reaction. It wasn't necessarily me going like, here's my middle finger in the air. But it was being like, OK, well, let's be open and transparent about it. Here's our business model. Like, you you, you know, like this is I want to just keep doing it. But this is how I'm deciding to do it or we're deciding to do it. Um, so what do you think the connection is personally for you between kind of what you described as you were saying you were suicidal and the dark periods of your life like what has feral served uh what role has that played in your life outside of obviously it's something that has kept you afloat or is kind of a beacon for you um and your love for doing what you're doing seems to be in large part something that is like driving you um so like what what's your relationship to it because i know here's the other thing too i'm i recently in the past year um, and I'm, it sounds like I'm a lot like you in the sense that when I'm doing something and I really give a fuck about it, like I really care, I'm doing it. That's like what I'm doing. There's other stuff is going on maybe, but that's really what I'm doing. So what happens is, is I have a tendency to get so wrapped up in something that I then become kind of like the thousand hand thing doing everything. You know, something's coming to me. I'm going to be on it. I'm going to do this. So in the past year, I've really had to learn uh, exactly what you described, how to let go and also how to delegate, which has been really, really difficult for me, but ultimately I think is helping me at least professionally stay a little bit sane. So I'm, I'm wondering how kind of feral interacts with your consciousness on a, on a day-to-day basis and what role it's kind of played in your life outside of all of the business and career achievements. Well, you know, I mean, it's, I'm still in the thick of it. I mean, I've, I've, I had a suicide attempt four Saturdays ago. Like I was like pretty much at my bottom. Um, I've, I got diagnosed with borderline personality disorder yeah. in the past year. Um, so I've been really like addressing my mental health, like head on and just trying to be open about that too. Cause I feel like that, you know, I feel like if I was having all these people tell all their secrets in their microphones and I was trying to like, you know, not be transparent. I'd feel really guilty or Mm. exploit over something. Mm. So I've been very open about that, but you know, it's a lot of hard work because I, at my core, I'm a workaholic, which Mm. is a very romanticized addiction in our country, (laughs) but it's actually very, um, it's not so awesome when you're an actual workaholic. I mean, yeah, I mean, I was a workaholic, in Wisconsin working at McDonald's in a grocery store like 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. Like I just like because the the thing is, is that um, there there is like a void in me that I don't like looking at myself. And like that's what's been hard in therapy because now I like when I I really that's I mean, that's why I quit meditating. I barely meditate. I haven't meditated for almost like, well, I I do a group meditation every week, but I I haven't been having a strong practice in Mm -hmm. over a year because like that looking inside myself and seeing that like, yeah. oh, like underneath all these huge emotions and ambitions or whatever, there's like nothing like I'm not <laughs> like I, it's a big fucking put on and I, I don't really feel anything. So, well, what, I, do, you, I, what do you think I, that is? I mean, that's that's a really interesting. I think that's a first of all, not to diminish it in any way or shape no, or no, form no. here. Uh, that's a very common problem. I think a lot of people as soon as they start touching either on the uncomfortable patterns of thinking that they have when they start meditating. Um, and, and I'll be full disclosure here. I am a terrible meditator. I probably get, if I'm lucky, uh, four or five days a month, if I'm like really, really trying. And like this yeah. is someone who I work with this stuff. All, all of my clients teach meditation, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. So I can relate to the difficulty that's going on. But back to kind of what you're describing is like the emptiness. What 
what do you think that is? Do you think it's actually a void or do you think, like, what is that? Because that's, I mean, this is a genuine question that I definitely don't have the answer to, but I think it's, it's worth touching on. I mean, this is the, this is the whole Buddhist philosophy. There's two sides of the coin. That's what Buddhists strive for is the emptiness that like, it's a big put on egolessness. Like in Buddhism, that's like a positive thing. But, you know, for me, it's like, I don't, I just, I have a, a deep lack of purpose and a very profound piece of like, where I don't, really have a lot of self-worth so like i have to distract myself so mm. i don't constantly have to like look inside myself the reaction the result of that is a very very dysfunctional personal life and a very functional career mm. and so like i'm just glad that like i take all this energy and i've managed to transmute it and mm. focus it and, and find something that i love because podcasting is like given me like all of my biggest dreams worked with all of my heroes, all of my best friends I met through podcasting. I've met, I've, I've gotten girls through podcasting, like <laughs> both of my cats I got from comedians. Like <laughs> it's, it's like, it's been this amazing, the community here is so loving and supporting. And like, I just, I'm very, very lucky in this cycle in this lifetime mm. uh, that I ended up dropped in this like stream that is podcasting that is this force that's this group of people who are just all of a sudden just moving and like i just got lucky like in the beginning i kind of jumped in the fucking river and like now it's like picking mm. up steam steam or whatever but like i think that thing inside is that like you know at a core it's um at, at, at the baseline thing, it's just human fear. Mm. If it's, if that's a fear of death or it's a fear of abandonment, which is my biggest thing, or it's a fear of like that we're all alone and that you really are alone with your thoughts and your pain. And there's some pain that you share and then there's some pain that's yours and mm. that's completely private and that's your pain. And like, you can't, there's no way like we can have empathy for each other, but there's no way that I can go and feel your pain and you mm. can feel mine. And so that my pain feels very, very intense in a way that like I, I can keep my shit together. I can run a business like right. I'm fine. But inside the second the door closes and I'm yeah. alone, it's I'm in I'm I am personally like have uh you know, I'm in hell. <laughs> but yeah, when I'm, no, I when I'm like... working and I'm around people and I'm with all these people, like I'm in heaven. So I got gotcha. you. So yeah. So well, that's. It sounds like it's also part. I mean, you can give a better definition in a bit about what BPD, borderline personality disorder, is and how that kind of factors into your perspective in life and what you're feeling. I can only relay that. At one point in my life, I was diagnosed as bipolar. Um, and I was on lithium for two, three years. And a lot of the things that you're describing in terms of the wanting to communicate or at least express or feel the, whether it's pain, fear, happiness, joy, but to communicate those emotions effectively is something that can really fuck someone up. Because when you feel like you're, you don't have like a vehicle or a way of kind of interfacing with other people or what's going on inside and reconcile that with the outside world, it can create a really shitty situation. So I, I totally get that. What I will say is this is, you know, and I've been on both sides of this coin and I've, I've realized that, you know, somewhere in the middle is probably the most beneficial approach. But, you know, when I'm feeling or when I've felt in the past that I just, you know, low self-esteem, not feeling great about myself, feeling that, you know, I'm a fraud or I'm not doing this right. Um, there's two things that I think have helped me. And I'm not saying this would help you or anyone, but they have helped me is that try to hold that whatever emotion it is, just hold it. You know what I mean? You don't have to uh, engage with it, even if you do. And my natural tendency, I have an anger problem. So like, if I get pissed off, I am witnessing myself go into a rage and still being completely incapable of stopping it. So it's not to stop anything from happening, but it's just to hold it and be aware of it. And then even if it sounds kind of schlocky or silly or new agey, that, that concept of loving kindness and compassion 
Um, you know, wherever you can start that with yourself, with someone else, with your cats, with whatever it is, that quality, the love and, and the, the camaraderie that you have with your friends. And, uh, you know, if you can extend just a teeny bit of that to yourself for five seconds a day, it's like a seed that eventually grows. And then you look and you're like, oh, shit, it's grown like a little bit bigger. And that just that having that little bit can can really help with kind of like the overwhelming experiences sometime of being alive, which I think in my life, I don't know if this is like for you, but that shit comes in phases for me. Um, there'll be periods of my life where everything kind of is going pretty smooth and then I'll just start getting on a roller coaster. And it doesn't mean that everything is out of control and I'm keeping my shit together, but stuff just seems to happen sometimes. And I think it's kind of cyclical. So, yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely relate. Can you maybe go into, because I really, another reason I'm, I'm thrilled to have you on here is the mental health issues um, are, are just something... Like I said, having been diagnosed and had some really intense experiences, uh, I think it's something that we, we would better serve everyone, the world, if we started talking about this stuff a little bit more and bringing it out to the forefront rather than kind of having people feel like this is something abnormal because a lot of people go through this shit um, and talking about it is important. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, you, that was beautifully said. I, I also am bipolar too, which seems to go hand in hand. I was also mi misdiagnosed mm. as bipolar and not PBD, but I am bipolar too, and I have mm. a very, very nice. Uh, my my um, psych my psychologist is really good, and I go to a community place where it's all social workers and people getting paid shit, <laughs> and she I have a very nice um, medication. Uh, regimen that I'm on that's just really nice but lithium's fucking hardcore dude that's like zombifies you that's like a really intense fucking drug to be on um, I think that uh, I'm starting to be more open about it because I my my mom is severely mentally ill major borderline personality disorder I have not talked to her in four years after like a major suicide attempt and just like a very toxicity toxicity but mm -hmm. there is in my opinion an event horizon where i feel bad because the baby boomer generation like was in every generation before it is supposed to like repress mm -hmm. all of those issues and not share them but and then you know they're just like lost and they're from a generation where they just didn't have the internet or access and were, didn't know what's going on with them not that we not that <laughs> i feel like we have better tools now to at least assess what might be wrong with us right. but there's only one way to do that is get diagnosed by a professional mm. and it's also very hard to find a good professional because a lot of doctors and psychologists and psychiatrists are shitty and yes. shitty at their job yeah so not all of them but a lot if, i'd say it's mo i say like 70 percent of them in my opinion. <laughs> i was gonna it's, say a little higher but sure. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, but you ha so you have to you have to shop around and it's like you have to get second opinions or whatever but anyway i feel like because right now like you know i'm very my way of coping with my darkness and depression is to constantly make fun of it like mm. i have to I, like everybody's like your tweets are really fucked up and I'm like, but that's, it's, it's like, I don't have a modes of expression because my, I help people make stuff. I still don't have something for myself that I can express like what I'm going up. What's so I don't have, I just like, I used to make music, but I don't mm -hmm. anymore. I don't have a thing that I do. Like my therapist was like, do you have a hobby? And I'm like, oh, I guess I don't yeah, I turn my hobby into my career. Yeah. Um, but like, I want to just, because even when I talk about it, even people I know that are, I work for are very good friends of mine. If I talk about having mental illness, like it gets quiet in the room and they look at you less, you know, it's like, you know, when I, when I yeah. told, when I told my good friends that, um, I was on antidepressants, they were like, oh my God, well, my friend, uh, our friend got an antidepressants and then killed herself. And you know, <laughs> it's like, well, there's a reason she got an antidepressant, <laughs> like, you know, so you know, that initial reaction to that, that like uh, that allergic reaction, like people thinking of you less, the more I hammer it, the more I come out as I am mentally ill. Mm. Like, I feel like it's 
the more of us start openly talking about it, the less of a stigma is because this country has a severe problem with mental illness. There is no fucking support. I live in Los Angeles where they, they there is a state of emergency right now because the homeless population is so high. Yeah. I'm just stepping over, you know, we just we just throw fucking that's you know, the whole idea of Skid Row is that um, downtown L.A. is that all these like schizophrenics and mentally ill people would get thrown in jail and they didn't know what to do with them. So they would just drive them down to Third Street and yeah. just drop them off. And they started that's basically like what Skid Row is. Um, yeah. So I think that like starting to like talk about this and, uh, and address it is become, you know, because with, you know, I have, this is where this might be one of the reasons I know making a judgment where I'm, I feel like I'm a bad person. <laughs> but <laughs> I have, since I started feral, I get, I mean, almost every day, at least every week, I get amazing tweets, messages, emails from people who are like, this really, really helps me. Like Feral Audio has done this. And also I have people who are like you talking about your mental health thing, like help me get diagnosed or something. Mm -hmm. And I had a girl at the bar being like, I listened to you on Duncan's podcast talking about it. My girlfriend has BPD. I didn't know what it was. And mm -hmm. I, I love her and I want to like work with her. And so, or work with her. I want to be with her. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so right now in my life, as I turn 30, this is sort of like, what I'm doing right now is like, cause mental illness really, in my opinion, is a thief. Mm. Um, I, it steals. The only thing you have in this life is, is time in the moment. And if you're, the moment is constantly miserable and you're in constant misery, there's three options in my opinion. Um, the f first option is to just continue living in misery and being miserable and never addressing your issues and just sort of like going about your life with never really like tackling it too is just like, even if you're putting your tippy toes in the water, just trying to work on yourself, whether that's therapy, exercise, meditation, that's option two. Option three is suicide. Hmm. And I have a complete, I don't, what's really hard right now is since I started coming out about this is the messages I get on Tumblr of kids like saying they're about to kill themselves I can't like I, I, I it's too much because I'm still in treatment. Right. I still have my own shit. So right. it's like I had to publicly like tumble. I was like, you guys can't write me these messages anymore because yeah. I don't I don't have I'm what I have to say about it is not what you're going to want to hear because I don't I don't I'm not all you want is somebody to go. No, 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 no. You're special. You're special. Don't do it. You deserve to live. That's not what I'm going to tell because you. Because if you're not, if that's not your viewpoint, it's hard to it's, tell someone that wholeheartedly. I think <laughs> it's a, it's, it's. I'm, I'm just. What I'll tell you is, it's certainly an option for you. Like definitely, that's definitely on the table. If what's the point of being in misery? Like what's the point of walking? What's the point of living seventy years or every day is unbearable in misery from the second you wake up and go to? That sounds like a really terrible life. Like mm. suicide definitely sounds like. Uh, a, a quick, easy remedy for that, but mm -hmm. maybe wait, mm -hmm. put it off, and maybe try before you do that option. Um, getting professional help, talking to somebody, re talking to your friends, your family, like telling somebody, just coming out and just letting this thing inside you that's eating up that you're ashamed of, and instead of being afraid what people are going to think or just sitting online and ruminating and mm -hmm. looking up WebMD shit, what might be wrong with me and never just fucking tell somebody yeah. and then make a, make a huge attempt to try to, even if it's for like, like you said, five seconds a day of just like try to find just some shred of happiness or some, not even happiness, just tolerating sure. um, the, your condition. Cause it's mental illness. Like, if you don't start working on it, which is why I'm starting to hammer it in people's heads, mm -hmm. you end up like my mom, who was always really troubled, but was super cool. It was the whole reason I'm into comedy. She was she lived in downtown Madison when the onion was coming out. She'd <laughs> run home and give me an onion. It was still warm from being <laughs> printed. And she said, read this. It'll make sense someday. You know, and when my hamster died, she took me to Mystery Science Theater 3000, the movie. She <laughs> made me stay up every Saturday and watch Saturday Night Live. Like it is totally because of her. I have my taste in comedy. But my mom just sl started slipping away. Yeah. 
borderline personality disorder, hoarding, suicide attempts. Mm-hmm. She's uh, bankruptcy. Her house got foreclosed on. I was breaking in through a window at night just trying to get my stuff out because the banks changed the locks on the Jeez. doors. Like, just st- watched her just deteriorate and her mind just slip. And, and at the same time, she's not, like, a very nice person either. Like, I don't, she's not a person that I would want to hang out with. She's kind of mean and, and uh, manipulative. And, and so at some point, like, it was right when I started Feral. Like, truly, she, we went to San Francisco for a wedding and she had a mental breakdown and drove over the Golden Gate Bridge and tried to kill herself. Jesus. And yeah. so I was like, you know, we went back to the hotel. We called the cops. They detained her. And I was like, thank God. And then we were driving down the fucking coast through the grapevine. And I was like re- relieved. And I was like, oh, my God, this is she's getting she's going to get help. She's going to get help. Yeah. She's hyper intelligent. She has a huge IQ and she's a social worker. She managed to talk herself out of lockup yeah, because man. and then they were trying to call me to verify it. But they couldn't get a hold of me because I had no reception. So she like talked herself out and then she went um and disappeared for two weeks and either was going to kill herself or was completely wanted me to think that she was so i spent two weeks mourning my mom like i i mourned her i thought she was dead so then all of a sudden she came back out of nowhere and i was like no i've 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 this is exhausting i can't i already mourned you this is too much of my mental energy and what I've done since I've removed that toxic person from my life is start a fucking podcast network (laughs) and do all this shit because my brain is freed up and like, you know, that, that might make me a shitty cold person where like, I, 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 I'm sure that I still feel like I'll definitely when, when she does commit suicide, which is going to happen someday. Um, I'm definitely going to be heartbroken and, but a part of me is also like, I think maybe that might be the best option for her. It might give mm. her some peace because she's absolutely in hell and tormented and, and her borderline personality disorder is extreme and she's in such pain. And she, I, once a year I text her, um, on my birthday, she'll text me and then I'll be like, I'm in, I'm in this program. You have borderline personality disorder. 80% of, uh, people who have it, moms have it. I, I blah, blah, blah. I'm in this program no response and then when she does respond just completely ignoring everything i said right. like just completely not looking at herself so it's just i don't know like i'm not going to save my mom but maybe um i'm not trying to save anybody but no like, no no what what you're doing is is touching on a really important thing when it comes to mental health and mental illness it it requires a personal effort right i mean that is the only thing there as much as we wish that we could do something to someone who's in pain and be like okay you're better now uh, that's just not how it works so unless the impetus is there to actually kind of get better like really it doesn't have to be full blown like yeah i'm gonna do this gung-ho it just has to be there it has to exist um and i think one of the things that helps get that to the surface or at least some uh, let someone identify it is just talking about it right i mean that's one of the things that I think, and I saw you put something up on Twitter, I think, and it was a way of like how to approach people uh, when they say something, who, who's depressed or, or has some mental issue. And, you know, when someone says like, hey, I'm having a really shitty day or I don't feel great, you don't go, oh, it's going to get better. Don't worry. Like things are definitely going to get better. Like that's not necessarily what the person wants to hear. They may just want to be acknowledged or, you know, just spoken to or just like seriously just there and listen and that to me another reason i think this is important is one of the best things you can do for anyone who's in pain whether it's mental illness whether it's grief whether it's just fear pain is just being there with someone and not judging them not trying to do anything but just saying like i'm here you know it's okay it's not there's nothing whatever's happening is happening but i'm also here is a really important thing um and i think that gets lost a lot because one of the things that happens in our society especially in this country is everyone is always trying to fix things and do things and achieve things and get things and when you apply that to people sometimes it doesn't work super well (laughs) you know that's not exactly how people work Um, it's just kind of how we're used to working so um, I think that's that's really powerful what you're talking about with your mom I mean you know one of the other things and this is this is maybe a little over the top for a lot of people but I've also found and I feel sometimes weird saying it 
But whether you believe in a higher power or anything or not, just saying some type of, call it prayer if you want, but just wishing well or putting something out there psychically or thinking it can actually have an effect on external reality. I think anyone who's taken psychedelics enough times might actually have that experience too. But I think that kind of underlies the structure of reality um, of what's going on, which kind of brings me to the next point. Thing I want to touch on with you um, is uh, I heard you on Duncan's podcast talking about, and, and this is something I'm asking a, a lot of my guests is what do you think life is? Like, what do you think where we are right now? What is this? Is there a point to it? If there is, what is the point? Um, and you don't, there's no, obviously there's not a right or wrong answer. So, um, well, it's going to be another long one. That's okay. Um, I, within the past year, um, turning 30 and just sort of like that culmination of my experiences, you know, early in my, you know, uh, born Catholic atheist at eight years old to like 20 or, you know, and for a while I was doing LSD and selling LSD and I was a practicing Satanist and was in this <laughs> punk rock band and we were just, and we were just like aesthetically doing, we we're fucking basically doing black magic and taking cool. acid and shit. Right. So I, 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 I did, I'm very lucky that psychedelics came into my life, um, when they did, um, you know, and it really excelled my growth, but you know, I was, I was in, I started reading about Buddhism and stuff aesthetically in my early twenties and right around, uh, like my friend passed away and I was just really devastated and I was sort of like a very angry person, which I still am, but sort of like this was the most altruistic, sweetest person, my first friend in the world who I lost touch with for selfish reasons and never knew that I really loved her is gone now. Mm -hmm. And it really like put my life on a different path. Like immediately everybody was just like, holy shit. So that's why, you know, I started working and I wanted to go to school and I, I, I wanted to like volunteer at things and help people. But like my idea of reality has changed tremendously over the years because you know when I was 25 and 26 I was really I'm really like this like concept of quantum physics like what are they fucking mm, talking about mm. this concept of time this concept of multi dimension what the fuck does that mean <laughs> and so you know and I do believe that you know we are living in a hologram that we 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 exist in an infinite bed of of information that is this has is this potential thing and then it's plucked out of the nothingness and thrown into motion it's this kinetic thing and then it runs out of energy and then we pop back out of, we pop out of existence and we go back to the infinite bed of the void the nothingness but you know that used to give me solace like that you know this whole idea like meditation and ramdas and cornfield and like meditating and just feeling that connectivity and that god like feeling god and that unified field like for a long time no matter how bad it got, I had this fundamental belief and practice that, okay, there are bigger things going on. Mm. There's an, there's an intelligence here. There's all these coincidences, all this irony. And you, I do believe you're, you're, we're just ghosts in a machine manipulating, manipulating matter. And we're the sh in the shitty clunky body operating and fum <laughs> fumbling around and acquiring things and, and putting things into shapes and moving things and touching, <laughs> touching other weird creatures and, and kissing them and hurting them. Like what are we, you know, so we're, we're this thing willing this body around culminating all these thoughts and ideas for, in my opinion might be, something bigger than us that is just trying to like, cause I, I believe that whole like time is a flat circle thing. I do believe that, um, this reality is happening in tandem and in every conceivable nanosecond in every, you know, direction on this two dimensional thing, time is moving forward and backward, but it's also repeating over and over mm. and over and you and I have had this conversation mm -hmm. <laughs> so many times and the thing about that is you know the Buddhists and Hindus call that 
hell. And that's what Nietzsche believed in this too. And Nietzsche was, this is like, this is the most terrifying thought to him that he had to live this life over and over again. And that's like achieving Nirvana is like, Oh, thank God. I don't have to fucking live the cycle anymore. Mm. Um, you well, know, there but- is, there's a distinction between the cyclical life and the hell realms in Buddhism and in Vedantic and Vedic scriptures. There are actually subdivisions of worlds that they describe, whether they're metaphorical or not, um, is up for debate. Uh, but I mean, yeah, I think what you're continue though, continue, continue. I cut you off. No, no, you, you, I love you are, you put in, I love how educated and (laughs) I, I, I I am a fucking simpleton. I am, I, all I do, I'm just only an audio visual learner. I can't fucking read for the life of me. Anyway, well, I, I, my, my whole thing that has changed is looking at my life and looking at how I feel in this weird sort of extreme fortune that I've had through hard work and, you know, I, I won't go into detail, but I, 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 people have said this to me too. They're like, you're like really unlucky. And Mm. that's like my role in life or whatever. And I, but I, I have to put so much energy and time and hard work into just have like, it's just to have like an okay existence. Mm. And my opinion in the past year is that I don't think this is meaningful. <laughs> and I, I think that this is completely fucking meaningless and we're creatures of order. We're insects with emotions. <laughs> we're just fucking insects and we're ruled by these electrochemical things. All of the emotions we'll ever experience are already installed in our brains. They're ne- we're not evolving <laughs> new ones. We're conditioned and they all have evolutionary purposes. Anxiety is from fucking uh, looking over your shoulder. Is there a fucking tiger coming or not? And then, <laughs> and then jealousy is because you want, you're, you don't want the fucking alpha male coming inside the the person you want to breed with. So it's like all of these ideas, this is fucking just pure chaos. And Mm. all we're doing as human beings is trying to make sense of it. And it's bullshit. And we, we, we take fucking shit and we take just fucking complete sprawling fractalized chaos and we put it a 45 mm. degree angle and then mm. we box it up and we mm. package it and we sell a tv and we do all this shit and we commodify it and we, we, we what we're doing is like we're just these creatures of habit and repetition because if we don't come home every day and see the fucking front door or you we don't fucking see these familiar objects we're just completely <sighs> sch- schizophrenic caught in the thing and i think this idea where every time in my life i was like Wow, isn't that a weird coincidence, dude? Isn't this like trippy? Isn't this fucking like ironic? Uh, I don't think that anymore. I, I I used to think like I used to have private conversations with God in my head. Or yeah, even yeah, loud, yeah. And I'd be I'd be like, wow, that's really you're that you're hilarious. That's really funny. Like, you know. But well, I think that this is a cyclical existence, and the only this just. Um, infinite repetition and these realities are constantly overlapping and the those those moments of coincidence and irony are just us trying to make sense and giving uh, our trying to romanticize or trying to give our lives a purpose and mm, saying mm. there's a higher meaning and it's completely a lie i love it i love we it. are I we love are this. it's it's I, I can't tell you how much I love this because I could, you obviously, you know, I, I couldn't disagree more just based on personal experience, which I think is all we ultimately can ever go on. So no matter how much I read or do anything, I think we all base this off our experience. So I love that you have that, uh, that that's your perspective because I want to play around with it a little bit. And just to be clear, I respect that, and I am not trying to change your mind or anyone else's mind. But I have questions, which are yeah, totally. Yeah, I, and I, I totally, I just nothing, nothing. I mean, nothing these are just me. thought experiences. Course, these are just course. convictions and feelings I have. I don't know. I, I been alive for 30 years i don't fucking know a thing of course i don't know anything no and i feel the same way about myself well my question is this is because i think you're touching on two concepts uh or you touched on one concept and and then brought up another one later on which i want to go into which is this this idea of chaos and kind of meaninglessness and how we can then take that apply some type of structure to it 
which makes us feel more comfortable, which I think what you're describing in a macro a microcosmic way would be how kind of our society is built. You just described society, right? I mean, we have organized it in these structures. It provides us some level of comfortability, and that allows us to continue doing what we're doing within a system. The other thing you touched on, which I love, because it's, it's one of the things uh, that has captivated me from a very early age is the idea of synchronicity. So that's the idea of these ren these coincidences or irony or things kind of locking up in lockstep for, you know, a brief moment in time. And what does that point to? So one of my favorite authors, psychologists ever is Carl Jung. He was kind of the, you know, alternate Freud, right? He had a famous split with Freud where Freud was like, hey, everything is, you know, developed in childhood. The unconscious is just what we experience. That's how we get out all our, like, things we can't actually consciously experience. And Jung was like, wait a second. Uh, I don't know about that. I think there's some other shit going on here because I'm studying people's dreams and I'm noticing that all these people are starting to have these very specific type of dreams that are popping up. So I think there's this thing called the collective unconscious, which is this shared unconscious reality that everyone is kind of plugged into all at once. And that's where we generate symbols from. That's where we generate culture from, archetypes, patterns, narratives, stories, um, you know, touching on a lot of stuff that Joseph Campbell touches on, right? The, the monomyth, the hero myth, which I know uh, Dan Harmon loves, which is awesome because Joseph Campbell, one of the coolest people ever. Um, but anyway, this idea of synchronicity, I had an experience, uh, fuck man, 10 years ago where I took LSD and I had taken LSD many times before, but I took it this one time and I didn't come down for three months. And I don't mean that I was like kind of tripping. I mean, I was full blown tripping for three calendar months. And during that time period, while I had incredible experiences, I experienced it all as one giant synchronicity. And I don't mean that in like an esoteric kind of ethereal sense. I mean, if I thought of something in my head, I would look up on a bus and there it would be. Like just that shit nonstop. So since then, and, and while it was going on, I'll point out that it was completely overwhelming to the point where you have no ability or I didn't have any ability to consciously interact with what was going on. I didn't have any kind of like retrospective awareness in the moment like well this is happening what what is this you know two years three years later when i started to kind of unpackage it i tried to put in context what the hell was going on i also started working at the same time with with ron boss's foundation love serve remember and you know if you look at my career now and who i work with all of these people ron boss jack cornfield all these people you'd say oh well this guy was uh you know, really into this stuff, and that's why he's working with these people. The truth is, is I had read the name Richard Alpert, but I was far more familiar with, like, Timothy Leary and Psychedelia. I didn't really know who Ron Bess was until about four years ago. I just happened to hear Raghu on Duncan's podcast. I happened to watch Fierce Grace, the movie about Ron Bess, the next day, not because of that. And then I went to their website and was like, holy shit, uh, this website's no bueno. I got to fix this. So I got in touch, spoke with Raghu and everything. I cannot say this enough. Everything in my life has flowered from that point in a way that I just was like, what the fuck? Okay, I'm letting go. And I can tell you that in my experience, there is something underlying kind of the seemingly chaotic world that we live in. Um, I don't, in ter as far as thought and spirit experiments, I mean, you mentioned before you were doing kind of ritualistic magic when you were on LSD, which I imagine is a very powerful way <laughs> to do ritualistic magic. Um, but simply by changing kind of the inner workings of what's going on internally, um, depending how much, you know, willpower and uh, intention you're putting in, you can change external reality if you're into and, and you mentioned quantum physics, too, which to me is fascinating. One of my favorite things about quantum physics is right. So they deal with the planks, right? One one thousandth of an inch. Right. That's one plank. Um, that's the quantum field that you're referring to. This is where things do not work like Newtonian physics. They don't work like, oh, this is thing is mass. It goes here. You know, things are changed based on whether you're looking at them. You experience it as a particle or a wave, right? It's very subjective reality. 
that reality also interfaces in with our own physiology, which is the synapses between our neurotransmitters and our brain are one one thousandth of an inch and smaller. So the things that are actually generating our conscious you know, thought and way of interacting with the world are actually in the quantum world. So we're living in two different kind of realities, which you're saying infinite. I also agree that it's infinite. But I do believe that there is some place for making time, reality, and just our general experience. I think it's pretty malleable. That's That's been my experience. 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Yeah. Well, you know, the, I just... Just that, you know, I'm not, this is, we're in a waking dream. Yeah. The only difference between this and when you go in asleep is there's consequences. You have a, <laughs> you, it's a feedback loop. You have a nervous system and you, this, you will end in this dream and someday you'll end and you won't have those dreams anymore. But like, just because like, you know, it, it's like they, with these quantum physics stuff, they're like, we're going to, we're going to split it in half. And then that's the God fucking particle and they, mm. every time they keep splitting it mm -hmm. smaller and smaller what happens six things pop out they're mm. quarks and quasons mm. and whatever the fuck and then what happens when they break those those down like more shit comes out it's like quicksilver going through your hands want to know why because it's fucking the universe protecting itself those things didn't exist mm. until you split mm -hmm. that thing they were created in order to protect the universe because the second you break the laws of physics because the laws of physics in this universe have to be uniform with the entire universe or can exist. So once you do that, this whole thing is going to fucking pop out of existence <laughs> in, in, in a plank nanosecond. Yeah, yeah, so like, yeah. And, you know, it's Alan Watts, too. He, 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 uh, one of my favorite Watts things is he's giving a lecture and he's just like, we look out in the stars and it, we see that it's constantly moving away from us. And we're like, well, it's, it's moving away at incredible speeds. He's like, if you're not trying to chase it, it won't do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but the thing is, like, uh, Niels Bohr and Einstein, who invented quantum physics, basically made the Newtonian, like, they made that uh, model, and it worked, and uh, added for all their math, and then the second they inked it, um, and they put it down, they were like, we know that this isn't it. Right. And, and then Einstein asked Niels Bohr, he goes, do you really think when you're not looking at the moon, it's not there? Mm. Um, cause there's like fundamental stuff. Now that is very spiritual and that is very mysterious, but at the same time, and I do subscribe to this idea that maybe the universe existed at one point we created or something uh, created some sort of like higher form of life, whether that's robots, whether they're like, finally we built them in these big metal fucking things. And they're like, we don't need this. This is yeah. fucking archaic. And then they turned into light and then they turned into a unified field of consciousness. And maybe there it's a complete simulation and they were doing it over and over and mm. over again, just to have every conceivable outcome. Cause my problem with parallel universe theory and this whole romantic thing is that they're like, well, in another universe, you could be a king or we'll all have wings. <laughs> like, fuck that. Like, why is this realm, why is this reality so awkward and weird and dirty? And like, why is it boring at times? Why is it filled with suffering? My fundamental belief, which I think I've said on Duncan's podcast, mm. is that we're constantly, every single cycle, those little quick quantum bits all of our cells are just at, at a nanosecond. You're dying a nanosecond before or later. <laughs> yeah, constantly. you mentioned it's just like and, a terrifying. And that's what's creating different outcomes. And that's how Hitler doesn't get born because a uh, fucking car, every realm, every nanosecond inches towards him when he's eight years old and finally fucking knocks him out. Like that's, I think it's this repetition. And that to me is very magical and meaningful. Mm. But at the same time, mm. these these beings, these fourth dimensional things that, you know, you take psychedelics and you, you go outside of it and you realize it's a big meat puppet show hmm. and you, you leave your body, but then, you know, what's the significance in that? Mm. We're not going to ever get to experience that just cause we're like making out with uh, God when every time we take huge doses of LSD and we're like, you know, flirting with the void and we're inching towards that. And like, I, I, I don't think that that necessarily, I think that no matter how much you're trying to strip away your ego, when you're 
taking those psychedelics and you're going to those experiences and it's revealing all this stuff to you that's already apparently in your mind or whether your brain's a radio transmitter and receiver for consciousness. I totally subscribe to all that stuff, but that doesn't mean that it's okay. It seems kind of violating Ah. that I have to exist. Well, I didn't ask to be born like, you know, like it seems sort of like I, I was an total peace in not existing. And then um, my for some sort of trajectory plucked me out of non-existence. And now, like, I got to feel pain and do with all this shit and I have to do all this paperwork. It's fucking so pointless. <laughs> like, what, what are we doing? I, I get that. I totally get that. And my what I think is going on is this. I think, you know, We're sitting there either in the void as consciousness, whatever. And I do think whether it's conscious, like I'm going to do this or some more kind of karmic law, I think we incarnate, uh, my hunch is we incarnate to experience life exactly like this into a realm that is rife with suffering and trials and tribulations. And I don't think it's pointless. I think, and this is the way I look at it. The worst periods of my life, like the absolute worst periods of my life, I've learned and grown more from those experiences than when I'm, you know, super fucking content, you know, watching football and like, you know, eating a hamburger or something, right? Like that's just a I'm placated at that point. So I think kind of this is a Ram Dass thing. He says, you know, the suffering of our life is the sandpaper for us to experience our incarnation, right? It, it works away all of the shit that's not real. So you keep whittling down into what is real. And the Buddhist concept of emptiness is a fucking dagger. It's really, really difficult and weird to kind of get into because the Dalai Lama, there's a cool book. It's really heady. I actually couldn't get into it that much. It was fucking mindfuck. But it's the merging of emptiness and bliss and that's what we're actually striving for so there are these two separate concepts and the unity of those in the venn diagram is nirvana is the the peace that we're we're all trying to strive for and whether it's a cyclical existence in it's just a self-generated machine that's happening i don't know but i i do think that we go through these things not in kind of like a nietzschean no reason that this is happening but that we've actually either, like I said, consciously decided to come here or karmically have decided to come here by previous actions that have reverberated back through countless dimensions in time and space. Um, and I, I think that's what it is. That's that's my hunch. I don't know. Uh, I don't remember my past lives if I've had them. I don't know what happens exactly after we die. Um, and I don't think anyone does until they experience it and remember it if that's a thing that people do. So, I mean, that's, that's my viewpoint, but I, I, I yeah, I, I, and I got to tell you, I love Ram Dass and Cornfield and, you know, in it, loving kindness, you know, in this program, dialectal behavioral therapy is based on a lot of Buddhist principles mm. and they fucking talk about loving kindness all the time. Like loving kindness. It's like a college, course, yeah. right? Yeah. It's like a huge section of it is loving kindness, but like, Okay, so yes, suffer. There, what suffering is is just change. Mm. It's we're in a constant state of change. Like Einstein said, uh, before the Big Bang, there was perfect uniform order, and then the Big Bang happened, and this whole experience of us experience time linearly, even though we know that it's not a linear, mm-hmm. but we're we're trapped and we're literally it's like. It's like when a bully grabs you by the back of the head and <laughs> fucking puts your head in the toilet. We're being forced to experience this literally. And it's that, like, as Einstein says, the only reason everything moves forward literally is for complete entropy. Mm. At some point, the everything in the universe will be completely... Uh, towards complete entropy spread apart and expand to a point when it's ripped apart and back to nothingness where all of a sudden what boom big bang happens all that's over again. the vedic that's vedic that's but, super vedic yeah yes but this idea that um yeah like the idea of it sandpapering you and wearing you down 
it's like, dude, this whole experience, everything you go through, that's the experience. But, you know, what happens when you change? Yeah. What happens in American Werewolf in London when he turns into a fucking <laughs> werewolf? It's, it's in complete pain. His bones are remolding. His skin <laughs> is bursting. His fucking teeth are growing. He's screaming. And he's changing into this. So if you took that and you slowed it down for 80 years, that's all that's happening is you're, you're I mean, if yeah. you want to live for 80 years, so, <laughs> but like, let it, that's all that's happening is you're turning into a fucking, you're just constantly changing and it hurts. Like right. that's, you come out of the womb screaming. Do you want to know why? Cause this shit fucking hurts. Like you gotta take air now. You gotta breathe now. You gotta be a human now. It I'm... hurts. It's pain. It's and what, it, well, okay. Depending on what you believe in, but you don't get to take any of this with you. Not that that that's sort of like an egotistical human idea of it, like the idea of taking something with you. Mm, but mm. this whole experience, it's not like this is where the idea of this feeling that I've mm. uh, that it's completely meaningless mm. is because it's just a bun- it's just a big show but it hurts and what's Mm, what's so what's the the point of that shitty show (laughs) yeah but but if if everything was content and chill it'd be super fucking boring and i get that would be hell right right. so like if there is a parallel universe so like i i I was looking at this diagram of all the conceivable um human emotions i saw you posted that yeah yeah (laughs) and if you look at it there's like the baseline stuff and it spreads out it's basically every word we have for emotions and the slice of the pie, because it's in a circle, that is happiness and joy is like twenty percent. Yeah, it's not a big enough. <laughs> but yeah, he, here's thanks what for I... the fucking scraps. Like where well, that's that's what we have to navigate this realm well, with. Here's is the... yeah. struggling to be happy. That's not a gift. That's mm. fucking a curse. Like struggling to just be happy and okay and just to like tolerate the pain that's not a fucking gift man we're we're something some sort of creature some sort of dimension is i don't think it's a friendly fucking thing Mm, i think mm. that it's a big meat grinder and it's just like we're being tortured it's paradise and it's hell so that i believe i think it's neutral right i mean i think intent and a lot of other things go into this that color our experiences and you're i think what you said about suffering being change is spot fucking on and i think what causes the pain with change is us identifying things that are by nature impermanent in this temporal reality as permanent. So we're like, this is great. This is the thing that makes me happy. I want this. And then knowing it's going to go away, that that sets up kind of a, a paradigm that's a, not a good situation for most people. Um, so I definitely, I hear you on that. Um, I think though, here's here's what I ask, right? So if this is, let's let's just take the Ram Dass concept of sandpaper, life being sandpaper to, to, to rub away the other stuff, right? What is the purpose of that, right? That just that's not good enough answer. I'm totally with you. That doesn't explain it to me. But what I have found paradoxically uh, in a lot of ways uh, in my life is the more you kind of look out for other people in certain ways, and what I mean by that is don't ever take care of other people at the detriment to yourself. That is fundamentally not taking care of other people because you're not taking care of the person who really is going to make that stuff go. But you learn these lessons, right? This is the Maharaji thing, Ninfuroli Baba. Really, really simple. Feed people, love everyone, tell the truth. That's his whole thing. And if you just take that at face value and attach to all of everything that's going on in life, uh, it might not work out exactly how you want. But the longer you hone in on certain concepts and ideas in this life, I have found that it does, if not change your external reality, at least change your internal reality, which is enough for most people. Because if I said, hey, listen, Dustin, I've got this pill, you take it, you're going to feel fulfilled, happy, loved, you know, every positive emotion, and you're still going to feel the negative ones, but you're going to be able to hold those in perspective too, get the full gamut, but just feel right. You'd be like, fuck yeah, I'm, I'm about that. So what I think is there is a place and kind of a roadmap for everyone to get 
to those places. Whether we get there or not, I have no fucking idea. I don't know. But I think that there's little concepts and things that we can key in on. And part of the process of being alive is meeting people, finding out about ideas, concepts, um, getting feeling relationships, uh, positive emotions, negative emotions. And they're kind of tools. They're little like things that push us along and kind of reveal what this whole fucking thing is about. Now, get back to me in five years, like it'll completely change my mind. I, I'm not saying that this is it and I figured it out in any way, but I have noticed these tendencies to time, that, that seem to be principles of life that seem to open up over time. And, and one of the things, I mean, to tie it back to Farrell, I mean, it seems like in a lot of ways, this thing you have set up through your experiences in life is kind of like a manifestation machine. You know, it's manifesting things that you are actively working towards and it's creating those things relationships people uh, opportunities um and i think that's in no small part because of you i mean it's you you're creating those things and that process i think can be applied uh to anything in life it doesn't mean it's like a magic spell or a potion and things work but it does mean that there's a relationship between what's going on internally what you're doing constantly and what happens in the world um, it's kind of like ritualistic, ritualistic magic in a way. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, that pill you're talking about, yeah. that, like happy pill, it exists. It's called Vicodin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I fucking hate Vicodin. I am not. I love, I love fucking opiates. Anyway, uh, uh. I, I, the, uh, yes, yes. We're, <laughs> we have fr- like the best thing in the world is friends and community. And that's the idea of building a community because we're right. all in this shit together. Right. And like we can have these shared experiences, but that's why we help each other because we're all in the same kind of pain. Yeah. And to different degrees and there's different types of people. And, and so this thing, this thing with Feral, this is all an accident, man. This is like I didn't plan on any of this. Right. Like it's it's bigger than me. It has it's really like you know, it's not selfless what I'm doing. It's completely self serving because it makes like it grants me opportunities to be around the people that I admire and all this shit. And it gives me, it's completely about me and it's completely it's about, cause it's all the only thing in my life that gives me any bit of comfort and happiness. Mm. So I'm addicted to it. But it's, it's both. It's also selfless. Listen, I mean, I am in not a completely different situation, you know, working with my pod network. I do it selfishly because I like being a part of something that is working, that I think is helping people. But on the same, you're doing this ultimately because with the first way you described how you got into podcasting is you heard something and connected with something in a way that you said, holy shit, I get it. This is what I want to fucking do. This is something I'm interested in doing. I'm going to do this. So providing that for other people and just the platform more more than just the content itself, but the platform to do it, I mean, I think it's an incredibly awesome thing, man. I really do. I, I think you're, you're totally on to something, whether you realize it or not. Um, you know, feelings of self-worth aside, I think you're a pretty fucking awesome dude, man, so... I, I, thank I think, you yeah. you too no and that's like you know these are all thought ex- like i i too have th- this is <laughs> this whole pessimistic thing is really who i am and like <laughs> me, me like sitting here like trying to like be like you guys no is, don't is, do is it. Dis- no no and i want to be because i feel like you guys are right and you guys are the real deal and like you're putting in the work and dude you're working with the most important people on the fucking planet in my opinion <laughs> like um, this, that, what you guys are doing isn't just entertainment and comedy. It's like it, you know, comedy may help people and all that nah, shit, but you guys are like, valid, man. but just make, valid. making it a network for free and broadcasting this type of ideas and stuff you're doing, it's really important and it's going to save people's lives and help people. And it, it already is, but like long term as it continues to grow, like you are doing a service to the universe. All those people are it, 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 selflessly, whether there's some you know, and Watts is like, I, he goes, this, you know, everybody has to make a living. This is my <laughs> living. This is my job. This is what I do. I go around and I talk to people, <laughs> but these are like fundamental things that I are experienced and I'm delivering it to you through my living and by coming here and speaking and like the whole, I'm a genuine fake thing, <laughs> you know, like me and, uh, Duncan had a conversation about Kurt Cobain once mm. and he was like, God damn it, man. Like, that's the most where he was like he killed himself because 
um, he was a fraud. He's like, that's the most pivotal moment of your life where you realize that that's mm -hmm. where like, that's where you become a person is when you realize that. And, uh, he, you know, like Duncan describes, it doesn't matter when you check out of the hotel because it's like in the scope of the universe. <laughs> like We're all basically living and dying at the exact same time. Pretty damn when, close. When you yeah. expand it, um, if if the, the bigger you take the universe, we're all in the same fucking one one thousandth of a second right. living this experience that's somehow stretched out for us. And I just don't – all that stuff like – is that intrigues me and aesthetically um, and philosophically intrigues me. It no longer comforts me. I'm <laughs> like, I'm just at this point when it's just like, okay, like um, I don't, I don't necessarily want to play ball anymore. <laughs> like I want off. I want I, like coach. I don't want to fucking play uh, life baseball. And it was what a stupid analogy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love that you're hitting um, with the baseball. <laughs> I mean, what the fuck? I hate sports. What am I talking about? Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I, at this point in my life, it's just it's the culmination of my experience. It's it's like, you know, two years ago, it's like fibromyalgia or arthritis or whatever the fuck I have. My body just starting to hurt. My like I already feel my body changing and I'm slower and I'm a better person now. Like I I I am still arrogant, but I'm slightly less arrogant and I've done things that I'm proud mm -hmm. of. And I've lived all these experiences, but I've lived a lot of my dreams right now. But now what I have to do is if I want to stick around, well, I don't have a choice. Someday I won't. But if I want to <laughs> hang out for a while, like I want to have a personal life. I want to have I want to feel like, you know, I just went through the worst breakup of my life. We both yeah. got diagnosed with BPD in our relationship. Oh it was a really, really bad fucking breakup. And I, I, I lost my car. I went broke. I, I, it was all hitting at once, and then I was just like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm really proud of myself for what I've done. Hey. I'm ready. Like I, I'm ready to go. Mm. And so I was like, I went on a huge alcohol and drug bender where I was trying not to wake up, and it was five days. I think it was over Labor Day weekend, where I was like, you know five day blackout and I woke up and my dear friends Dave and Courtney I woke up in their on their couch and they were like come here and get a cup of coffee what's going on they like you know scoop me up and took care of me and then they're like dude are we we just lost our friend to fucking drugs what are you doing you can't right. do this right and then you know it's like the second I left I just started up again and yeah. I was just going through this thing and then every time I've hit rock bottom without romanticizing it mm -hmm. has been a transformative moment right. whenever you hit the floor and you decide to not just lay there and drool until you starve and die anytime you hit bottom and you're laying on the floor fucking writhing can't go on anymore the second you stand up you're you are making a decision to live essentially in my case i had a very very rough night where I could not let go of this fucking relationship. Yeah. I had nothing. To me, all I had was this relationship and she had she was over it and had moved on and I wasn't. I was clinging to it and I was I was like turning into like a drug addict. Yeah. It's an addiction. I was acting like a crackhead. Yes. And I then know it. I know it. And yeah. then like I was just like Peace out. I had I had a fucking noose just tied in my apartment, just hanging around forever because I taught myself how to tie it. And then I was I was like, I don't know if I can make another one because I'm really shitty at this. <laughs> but I had it hanging it's out. A, it's then, a good thing to be shitty at, by the way. It's a really <laughs> good thing to be shitty. Yeah. At. Anytime you're anytime you're on WikiHow look, <laughs> looking how to tie a noose, you should call your therapist. That's probably um, <laughs> a good good tip. <laughs> but you know, and I didn't I didn't I didn't. I didn't start texting friends. I didn't tweet about it. I wasn't leaving. I didn't want to leave a note. I right. went up to my rooftop because I have this huge rooftop. It was four in the morning. I drank a fucking, I downed a bottle of vodka. I was like crying. And then I put the fucking noose around my neck and I tied it to a post. And it wasn't like I'm a survivor. I was just testing it out. Mm. Like I'm looking over. I'm like, oh, if it breaks, I'm just going to fall and break my legs or my back. Like, but you know, I put her on my neck and then I sort of like went over this ledge and it just, it like fastened so quick. Like it went yeah. so fast and I cut my, I was immediately not being able to breathe. And I was like, fuck, fuck, fuck. And, um, 
I learned that if you drink a bunch of booze and try to hang yourself, all you do is start vomiting. <laughs> it's oh just started God. coming up. And I've thrown up from alcohol maybe less than five times in my life. So then I took this thing off. I'm like on my hands and knees. I'm like puking off the side of this building. And I'm just like, and then I just lay there. I have this big, nice rooftop or whatever. And I'm mm. just laying there till the sun comes up. I like taped my keys to my front door and left mm. my door unlocked. And like, so someone could like take care of my cat. Like that was, Jesus. Yeah, that yeah. was it. This is four weeks ago. Yeah. And then I came out. I was like, fuck it. I don't want to hang myself. That's a horrible way to go. Let's think about another option. So, <laughs> I, I definitely got that out of my system. And so I told my therapist this, you know, and I'm, you know, there's people with BPD, they have the highest suicide rate, which mm -hmm. is 10% of people with BPD Jesus, wow. successfully commit suicide. Wow. My suicide attempts and my suicide ideation, which is a, which is a very common uh, on paper thing with BPDs is like cutting. It's like how I cut, you know, and it's like, it's my self abuse, but like it can go really far, really fast. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, the, the worst part of this whole realization, this worst part of getting diagnosed BPD is when they, this textbook that they give you, when I open it up and I look at every single page yeah. and it's my personality word for word, it's everything I do in a fight. It's everything I do, um, internally. Like it's so I'm that unoriginal like they are, <laughs> no, like it's... i'm just a fucking insect with a broken brain and uh... it's like that's what you know that's all like what am i gonna like okay so bpd isn't curable it's an emotional dysregulation disorder where you experience emotions like very intensely mm -hmm. you also get to experience joy uh, and happiness yes. when in the rare moments and you know sex and food and music like i get to experience that a little more intensely than other people do mm -hmm. but more often it's the negative qualities it's, right yeah but like you know so it's a it's like a year-long course it's like a college course you do this whole thing twice and you just learn these skills you learn how to have interpersonal relationships and every time your emotions flare up you learn how to like yeah cool down and it's hip and you put ice water in your face or you leave and you breathe and you meditate and you you know you do all this stuff that it's all about regulating your yeah. emotions but at the same time like I have to like sit here every day and battle my brain for the rest of my life. Like it's well, exhausting. Yeah. It's I mean, I can, I totally understand. I think uh, anyone who's had any type of mental discomfort extending that out, out theoretically for your entire life could be a daunting prospect. I mean, while BPD might not be curable, I mean, I get the sense, and I could be completely wrong, that you do have some internal flame that's keeping you lit personally right i i do believe yeah. that and i think you know bpd bipolar schizophrenia these are labels for things that people have observed over a certain period of time and applied to characteristics right symptoms it doesn't mean that it's like you just got diagnosed with terminal stage four cancer and there's nothing they're going to do. You know, it doesn't matter how much cannabis oil or anything you're taking. That's the diagnosis. It means it's something you have and that you work with and you don't know what's going to happen going forward. It doesn't mean it one day it's magically going to be gone. But I mean, I, I know there's people out there with BPD who are living lives where it's not feeling like this is a, this is some type of horrible mental death sentence. Well, like it's actually the most one. It's actually the most treatable. It, this this TBT thing was created by Marsha Linehan, mm. um, who came out later as having BPD. It's actually wow. the most successful form. Like a lot of BPDs live like lives, but you know, this is if I love podcasting and I love these people and they're good people. Um, all these people in this community, everybody on Feral and beyond, are mm. good good people. Yeah. And they deserve to have a voice and a platform for that. And like this whole conversation has been just very personal and very yeah. self selfish. But like if it wasn't for podcasting, like I would be a much more miserable person. I'm not going to sit here and say I wouldn't be alive, but maybe. That's like yeah, you option. don't. Yeah. But like this thing just terraformed my life and it brings it just 
brings these fucking it's an excuse to just be around these people <laughs> and i used to be like oh i have no friends because none of these people would be my friends if i wasn't like offering to them but it's actually like a pure friendship because yeah. it's a reason to get together every week yeah otherwise you people I, I have friends that i've been with for 10 years we see each other like once or twice a year right and these podcasters i see once a week and like we have these relationships whether you know and for a long time i was like I have a hundred part-time friends, but you know, nobody close to me, which is why my girl, like important for me to have a girlfriend and stuff, but I'm terrible at it. And I have to accept that I have this thing where I'm really, really bad with close relationships. And the, the most responsible thing I can do for myself and for other people is to keep him at a distance and like really keep relationships casual, keep friendships, you know, like for now, a pro- a for problem, now. Well, a problem with me is I'm constantly oversharing and I'm really like I'm very much asking too much people and I'm constantly like dumping my problems on people. And like I I realize that and I'm trying to change that. But like I exhaust friends, too. Like I mm-hmm. have falling out with friends all the time. So what I really, 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 really want to do with my life is just keep, I really believe in this thing we're doing and I yeah. want to keep making a platform and I want to protect this art this 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 um i want to protect whatever this is because we haven't really seen anything like this ever i agree and it's owned by the people and when the shit goes down and they're censoring everything and it's completely state-run media martial law (laughs) like the only way you're gonna like get fucking real information is gonna be podcasting because they're not gonna be able to stop it right i agree so there's bigger picture stuff. I know that's grandiose, but like, yes, where it's entertainment, but it's more than that because we're we're developing these like human connections in no other way. That I mean, music does that, but like, music is amazing, but it doesn't really like accomplish anything because there's like, I mean, that's why musicians and comedians are like have a weird like relationship with yeah. each other because comedians get to express, in my opinion, more than like musicians do. But musicians get to express something that's more personal and meaningful and universal so i don't know there's just all these ways to convey whatever this fucking thing this whatever this experience is whatever we're doing whatever this unified field of consciousness is making us grow out of the earth like flowers (laughs) and and pollinate pollinate this place with our ideas Mm -hmm. and our love and our sperm and babies and fucking (laughs) communities and like we're pollinating this place and we're doing a shitty job because we're destroying it but whatever we're we're where uh, there are good people out there, yeah. they, des- they deserve a voice. But man, I, I this is like one of the best conversations I've had. My phone is dying, but oh, like, okay, uh, um, I could talk to you for another hour. But uh, yeah, man, no, no, and I gotta go to this uh, this Tim Heidecker thing later. But uh, dude, this has been fucking awesome. I I definitely want to do it again, and and just personally, listen, and I mean this seriously, and I say this to a lot of people. Some people take it, me up on it, some don't. If you ever need to talk about anything, I just text me, call me, whatever, dude. Like seriously, I think you're. I I really, I think what you're doing professionally is really awesome. But I think you as a person, dude, like you're you you. I th- I can see that you both sell yourself short and don't sell yourself short. But I'm happy to encourage the not selling yourself short because man, you're you're pretty fucking awesome guy. So, thanks yeah, for you this. too. Thanks, man, and um. I mean, having a conversation that's not being a podcast, I mean, I don't know. I don't know about that, dude. Uh, okay, dude, congrats, because I, I could never, I'm ter- I like guesting on these now, but yeah. like I could never host one. It terrifies me. You're, you're, good, you're, you're, you're good at running a running an hour, so congrats, uh, thanks, dude. Thanks, man. But yeah, let's, when, let's do this often, man. Yeah, like, I'd love to. You. Cool. All right, brother. Thanks, man. Hang yeah, in there. Take care. All right, be easy. All right, bye.